All right, so today we're going to do the uh, multiple regression lab. Um, hopefully you've already watched the um, earlier big idea one where I walked through the older lab that kind of showed you just the basics of how the commands work. So um, lab seven is multiple regression. Um, some of the older versions say lab six. Don't let that confuse you. They're the same. Um, all right, so um, this lab actually has a bunch of explanations. So a lot of things I'm going to say are also in the uh, text, so hopefully that'll help you. Um, we're going to load a whole bunch of packages. Um, the new package we have is called CV Tools, and if you don't have it installed, which I don't, then you're going to need to take off the hashtag here and run that. Remember, install packages downloads it from the internet, um, and then library brings it into the computer. So um, there you go, and it looks like everything there is fine. All right, I put the hashtag back so that if I run it again in the future, I'm not going to need it. Notice here is a random uh, seed that we're going to use. All right, so um, we're going to use that salary data that we looked at before. So here is um, in line 30 is just a quick ggplot um, to remember that uh, salaries versus years of service. Um, remember this data set was originally part of a lawsuit about gender discrimination. And the first thing we notice is that the most senior woman on the faculty has been there 38 years or whatever. So we're gonna trim off everyone over 40 years um, so that we can compare people to each other. Remember, you do get a raise the longer you've been at a school and also some of those older uh, faculty are kind of, they have kind of weird salaries. All right, so Sal 40 is this uh, data set we've made with just the ones that are over 40. And again, I zip by it real fast, but we just filtered. Okay, then the pairs command, remember, is uh, the graph that looks at every uh, variable against every other variable. Certainly, we see that years of service and years since PhD correspond very well. The categorical variables rank discipline and sex. They make two dot plots that are sort of hard to read. Um, but the question we're going to be interested in here is whether or not sex um, is really an important variable. All right, so. Um, now moving on here to the uh, fourth chunk. Um, oh, and I should mention up here, this also made a correlation plot between them. So we can see how the variables correlate with each other. Remember 1.0 is perfect, so variables correlate with themselves at one, but years of service and years since PhD correlate at 0.87. Salary correlates only at 0.5. So if we think of R squared, that's about a quarter, right, half squared of the variation in salary is due to years of service. So that means something else is going on and it could be a random effect or it could be one of these uh, things that we're adding. Okay, so down here, this next chunk is uh, gonna basically review what we did in the simple regression lab. So we're gonna compute the simple salary predicted by years since PhD using the data set SAL40. We're gonna get the summary of that and then we're gonna add the predictions and the residuals to make a plot. Remember, add predictions and add residuals Predictions are what the value would be if it was perfectly on the line. Residuals is that vertical distance between them. So um, here we go. Um, so first, this first uh, output here gives us this prediction. Notice that um, we get an intercept and a slope here. So just like an old linear equation. So we would expect a new faculty member would make 86,000 because that's years equals zero. And then year since PhD, we would expect a $1,300 raise for every year since then. I've mentioned this before, Truman faculty don't make nearly this much. So sorry about that. Over here is the p-value. We've talked about the limits of p-values, but in both cases here, the p-values are pretty uh, crazy. And as I predicted, it's about a quarter of the variation in salary can ex be explained by years since PhD. Then the two plots we made, one with the prediction. So here is our prediction and we just drew the line of those predictions and you can see it kind of runs right through the middle. And um, here is a plot of the residuals. And I mentioned before that um, the uh, residual plot, what we really look for there is to see random variation. And what we see is actually not really random variation, but rather that it's increasing as it goes along. So um, that would be a sign that the data is not heteroscedastic, uh, which is a word, or it is heteroscedastic, um, which means that the variation changes over it. And that makes us worry a little bit about our linear model here. And there are ways to correct that, but typically in data science, we don't worry about it too, too much. Okay, 
So that was review. If I went too fast, feel free to slow it down or back up or watch it again or go back to the lab five to make sure you understand how simple regression works. What's nice about multiple regression is coding wise, it's not actually any harder. All we do is we add plus after this thing. So here's our prediction variable salary is predicted by is how you might read the tilde. Your sense PhD plus sex. So you can think of that as and. Okay, and we're going to get that same uh, prediction map and because we have the color, we can make color equal to that sex variable. So now we get two regression uh, models. And you can see that the female line really is lower than the male line. Um, if we look at the numeric output, which I put down here in a separate one, you can see that now starting salary is uh, about $80,000. Year since PhD is about $1,300 a year. That's a little different than we had before. but gender, sex, which we've now put in as a categorical variable, only takes two values, female or male, in this data set. And um, by default, it uses the first one in alphabetical order as the baseline, so female comes before males. So a male having a one for male as opposed to a zero, if you want to think about it that way, <clears throat> adds an extra $8,000 to your salary. So what this quick model shows is that there's an $8,000 gender difference. Crazy, I know. And so as part of this lawsuit, that would be pretty good evidence that there's something going on here. And again, if we look up here at this chart, we can see that there is a difference in the um, slope of the lines here. The slopes are actually pretty parallel, which tells us that it probably is a linear effect, but that spread is about $8,000. So the fact that the blue line is above the red line is a bad sign if you're the university defending yourself in this lawsuit. Now, um, looking here, you can see though that the gender coefficient is not significant, 0.06. And so that makes us think it's moderately significant, right, between 0.05 and 0.1. But that makes us think that maybe there's something else else going on. Um, another thing to notice is the multiple R squared of this model is only 27%. If you remember our earlier one was 25%. That's not actually a very big difference. Uh, where did I put it? Uh, output. There it is. Um, right, we had 26.3% of our variance explained here, 26. And here we have about 27%. Adjusted R squared, remember, penalizes for extra variables. So that comes out almost exactly the same. So that tells you that while it seems like something's going on with gender, we haven't quite captured what's going on. All right, so. Um, Another thing we can do is we can look at interaction terms. And interaction terms we typically don't do in data science, but we do in regular regression. So if you take the regression class, you'll learn all about those. And what that means is that you multiply the terms together. So that would be a question of maybe the gender effect gets bigger as you get older or the gender effect is smaller as you get older. And if we do that, um, and we run that model, um, what you can see is now the slopes are different but the female actually catches up. So that would make us think there's a bigger difference among younger uh, hires. And that probably shouldn't be true because you would think that gender discrimination should get less strong. But more importantly, if we look at the summary of that, um, you would see that it's not very significant at all. So we're not gonna use that anymore in this model, but especially those of you who have had regression in another setting, econometrics or stat regression class um, or some other regression place, um, the interaction effect isn't useful here. Interaction effects really slow down model making. So when we're running big data models, statistical models, we tend not to use them because they really slow down our analysis. Okay, now the moment you've been waiting for, which is to stick all of our variables into our model. And what's sort of funny about the coding part of this is that it's actually a shorter command. So one way you could do this is with this line 15, which I've commented out, which says salary is predicted by rank, discipline, years since PhD, years of service, and sex. So that's all the variables just stuck in and data equals sal 40. But we can actually use this shortcut of a dot, a period. So salary is explained by dot. In this case, the dot means every other variable we have. So if we run that model, what you can see is now it sticks in all of these different terms. So again, rank was a categorical variable. It had values of assistant professor, associate professor, and professor in that order. So a new assistant professor would start at $65,000. If they were promoted to associate professor, we'd expect $11,000 range. A full professor makes $40,000 extra. Again, at Truman, it's not that big. Um, 
Then we had two disciplines. So there were two different departments in this study. So you could imagine business and accounting or math and statistics or whatever. And again, they're anonymized, so we don't know. But discipline B makes $13,000 more than discipline A. Year since PhD still has an effect, although it's smaller, about $700. That's because we know that typically associate professors and full professors are older. So there's less of an annual uh, change in your salary because there's really a big bump when you get promoted or those who have full professor make more. Years of service you can see is now negative. That's actually funny, but because years since PhD and years of service correlate together, typically these numbers go together. So you can actually kind of subtract them and say, every year you've been there is sort of a plus $200, whatever, 700 minus 54. So there's actually almost no annual effect um, in there. And in fact, what it shows is that people who had another job before they came to the school tend to make more than those who have worked their whole career at that school. And that's actually often the case because when you hire people at a higher rank, they often have years of experience somewhere else. So there is sort of a funny uh, effect of that. Finally is our gender effect. And we can see, first of all, that the gender effect has gone down to $5,000. But more than that, now our p-value is super not significant. And what that makes us think is that even though there is a gender difference in salaries, a lot of that is explained not necessarily by time in service, because remember that wasn't by itself enough to cancel out the gender effect, but by promotion or by being in the two disciplines. So you could imagine maybe the one department doesn't have very many women in it and it's a high paying department. Now that could point to some broader discrimination in the department, but it doesn't uh, really have a good effect uh, to show you there. So what's happening is that that gender effect, even though the value of it is still something $5,000 is not nothing, it's totally not significant now. Now, what else is weird if we look at this is now we've gotten our R squared up to 50. So half of our variance has been explained. So there's still a bunch of random variants or variants that we can't really look for. And we could look for other variables that aren't in this data set. But now we're uh, sort of confused. Now, I want to move from this step because using the full model seems like it's the best. But that idea of parsimony that a simple model is better, certainly including both of these uh, variables doesn't seem to be very good because um, they kind of cancel each other out. Um, that discipline effect does seem to be the super most significant, so it's probably going to stay in. But do you want to have all of these models uh, or all of these variables in the model? So there's a couple ways to do that. Um, we're going to use what's called the AIC criterion, the Akaiki Information Criterion. And that's a different way, like re um, adjusted R squared, of preferring a simpler model while also trying to get the most accurate model. And so um, the AIC just gives you a value comparing all your models. So this uh, command here in line 139 is just gonna create a value to compare all of our different models. And what you can see is that um, the years in service has an AIK of 8580. Adding sex only makes it a tiny bit better. Um, and then our all variable is way better though. So that tells us that uh, something is there. The interaction model notice is not better because its value is actually uh, higher than the one with just the two linear models. So this AIC penalizes including that extra term. Again, those of you who had other stack courses, you would say this is using degrees of freedom um, as part of the model that every value you predict, every uh, extra predictor you put in the model takes away degrees of freedom. Um, if you don't know what that means, that's okay. Now, we can then use a stepwise process. So what stepwise regression does is it uses this AIC criterion to start with our full model and then take variables out and to see which one makes the model most better. Um, so it's an algorithm, it's an iterative process. If you take the regression class, you'll learn how to do this by hand and it's pretty tedious. But with the computer, especially with a data set this big, um, we can start to run this. Now, this process I just described is called backwards regression. There's another thing called forward regression, which computers tend not to do, but that's where you start with no model and you add in variables as they're important. With backwards stepwise regression, we start with the full model and take the variables out one at a time. Now, this gives a lot of output, so I'm gonna run this and I'll walk you through it um, real quick. So, we start with the full model and we see what um, variable um, we're going to take out and it turns out that the least important variable is sex. 
So um, by doing that, we're going to decrease the value of uh, the criterion by taking it out. Notice taking out none is the starting point and taking out all the others is going to increase that criterion or make a worse model. So now we've done that and now it runs and actually now sex has fallen out of the model because all of these other things have now become important. And in fact, it does still matter having these two variables in here so that, um, again, years of service and years since PhD kind of cancel each other out. So that's sort of a funny thing, but what we've done is we've sort of shown quantitatively that sex actually isn't the important variable here. And in fact, this sort of analysis was done as part of this lawsuit and um, it was shown that there wasn't a gender effect. Now, that doesn't to say that there's none at all because of course, you could then argue that maybe getting promoted to associate professor or professor has a discriminatory quality to it. Um, that maybe women, the work that women were doing or something about the way they were being evaluated wasn't fair. And this model can't do anything about that, of course. Again, I'll mention that at Truman, we really don't have these problems and at Truman, um, we have almost no gender effect, and certainly when we look at these professor bumps, um, there's almost no difference here. Although, again, our salaries are way less. Um, okay, so um, the last thing I'm going to talk about is another kind of finding error, and it's called root mean squared prediction error, or RMSE. And what that does is it calculates how far off your model is from what you predict. So we talked about those residuals. So the residual, if you just imagine that you square that number, add them all together, calculate the average, and then take the square root of that, that's gonna be root mean square prediction error. Okay, so um, if that calculation sounds familiar, that's literally how we calculate standard deviation, right? You remember that formula from back in intro stats. So what we're doing is we're finding how much variance there is from our model to our actual. Now, what's cool about this is you can use this mean squared prediction error not only on the actual data set you use to build the model, but you can use it on future data set or separate data sets. And so in the other video, we'll talk about how to make a test set and a training set, um, which is one way to do that, because if your model works on different data, then that's a sign that it's a very good model. So here is sort of a long uh, pipe chain. And what it's doing is it's adding in the residuals of each of those different models and then it's summarizing across them. And so what we can see here is that um, these models um, are getting bigger. And notice here all is giving you the smallest error. Right now root mean squared error doesn't take into account that parsimony argument. So for root mean squared error a bigger model is going to almost always be better. That adding in that variable is going to be better than the backwards uh, stepwise regression and it's going to be better than uh, the one with the uh, interaction effect. Um, the one with just the two additives is a little worse than that, and the one with just one variable is going to be worse than that. So if for RMSE, when you're looking at the own data set against itself, you're going to always get a better conclusion. Now, that idea of having two, splitting your data into two so you can use one to train a model and one to test a model, again, we're going to talk about that later. But there's an automated system called uh, cross-validation. And what it does is instead of splitting your data into two, it splits your data into 10 multiple times. So again, that's the sort of thing that doing by hand would be crazy because it would take you forever to do. But when you're a computer, um, you can actually do it pretty easily. So what we're going to do is we're going to use, uh, divide the data into 10 folds and a fold is just a split of the data. So if we make 10 folds, you're just going to make 10 even sized chunks of data. I shouldn't say chunks, buckets of data. And we're going to use nine buckets to predict the model and we're going to guess against the tenth bucket to see how well it works. And we're going to do that for all sets of nine buckets. So we're going to run 10 separate regression models, see how they work against there and compare it like that. Okay, so that's going to give us another measure of the parsimony because this idea that a simple model predicts better. Now this command is in that CV tools package, which is why we installed it. So CV fit is the command we're running. So just down here, these uh, five lines of code are just doing that CV fit, making a regression. Each regression is gonna, so we're gonna do 10 cycles of 10 regression models. So we're gonna make 10 folds, 10 different times. So we're literally running 100 different regressions on that. Again, computationally, 
it's kind of tricky to do. You'll see that it actually runs pretty fast. Even here, I'm working on the virtual machine. And right, it takes a minute to do each one, not instantaneous. And then it spits them all out on a data set. Now, we would expect our root mean squared error, because now it's going to average across all of these 100 models, will be higher. But the question of which one is better, and here you can see that the all is still a little bit better than the backwards regression. So that gender effect is tiny, but it's still there. And those two models work way better than the simple model. Okay, so cross-validation is a tool that um, is pretty useful and it works pretty well for things. Um, we're going to um, leave it a little bit open-ended. Which one of these methods is best is not a question that's easy to answer. Certainly using stepwise regression is a good idea. Using uh, root mean squared error is nice. Uh, root mean squared error is also nice because you can look at different kinds of models. Right now we're just doing regression. Certainly regression, if you only know one model, regression is the one to know. But as we start to add some fancier models, you can use the RMSE to compare across um, trees and forests that we're going to talk about here in the next couple weeks and even other models that we aren't going to talk about. Even if you don't know what the model does, comparing RMSE is a way to see how well they work. Okay, so there's a few questions here for you to work through on the lab. And as always, if you have any questions, uh, let me know.